In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. I'm here in what's the very centre of London, Trafalgar Square. And this city is the capital of what was once the greatest empire the world had ever seen. It's played many roles through its history, but what really lies beneath the face of London? What is it like today in 2022, post Queen Elizabeth's passing? And how did that compare to 1872 when Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days was first published. I want to know. I want to get an idea of this special place through its streets, which are immersed in living culture and traditions. And I want, I want to understand why the locals here revere and adore living in this great metropolis of London. Now, the history of England is one of invasions, cultural revolution, and change. When the Ice Age finished and sea levels rose, the low-lying land of modern-day English was swamped, creating an island. It was first inhabited by modern humans during the Upper Paleolithic era, but took its name from Angles, a Germanic tribe from the Anglia Peninsula who settled there in the 5th and 6th centuries. The Iron Age followed the Ice Age, when hunting continued as a source of food, but farming technology developed, allowing the nomadic peoples to create settlements, and early farmsteads began to appear on the landscape. It was named due to the use of bronze and copper to create tools and weapons and decorative items for peoples known as the Celts, the Bronze Age existed from 2500 BC to 800 CE. It was during this period that large stone meeting places or henges, such as Avery and Stonehenge, were constructed. I'm here on Earl's Court Road, first morning in London. And I gotta say, it's really good to be back in a city where people actually live. God, I don't know what my memories of New York were like you know, when I lived there. But this experience has confirmed to me that you know, people in New York, some of them thrive, some of them barely survive. But they don't really live there. It's not a place where you live. Even though this is, you know, Chelsea and it's in a trendy inner city suburb of London. It's a place where you could live. You know, there's a nice pub here. It's cosy, not too ridiculously priced. Just walking through Chelsea, next to a cute little park. Back to my place, the residence. There's a really nice ease about this little suburb. Such a change from New York. Walking around New York, I was so sick. I had a head cold, my stomach was killing me. My lungs were congested. The weather was awful, I was freezing and wet. God, I couldn't wait to get out of that place. I kept hearing Lou Reed's song the, the Dirty Boulevard playing wherever I went. 
So glad I'm in Europe. Let's see if I can extend my stay a couple of nights. I'm here in Trafalgar Square. And I'm here because it's something very special, something very significant for London. And I don't mean the statue of Nelson. It's a actually a statue of Charles I. And it's set apart in the south side of the square on a particularly lonely island. And it is said that is the epicenter of the city of London. The same Londinium that was settled by the Romans as the very first inhabited enclave. And it's from here, like concentric circles of an onion, the city of London spans out. Eventually the Celts came to the attention of Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, who sent a military expedition to England, and this was 55 BC, but he failed to conquer it. The Romans did succeed, however, in 43 BC, when Emperor Claudius successfully led an invasion, and they ruled England as a colony for the next 600 years. They brought with them the elements of their own civilization. They constructed roads, cities with forums, baths, aqueducts, and theatres. The Romans brought culture to the barbarians, if you like. Traders and craftsmen arrived, and the Anglo-Roman population grew. In 120 AD, Emperor Hadrian commissioned a massive war between England and Scotland to dissuade the Picts and the Scots and it was known as Hadrian's Wall, and it marked the northern boundary of the entire Roman Empire. And as the empire began to crumble, troops were withdrawn back to defend Rome. But in 410 AD, it fell to a Visigoth army, and England was left to defend itself. Essentially, the entire structure of London is based around that original settlement, that Roman settlement, for what was then known as Londinium. And it's from there that the city is spread out in concentric circles, much like the rings of an onion. As I said, the city of London was founded by the Romans and their rule extended from 43 AD to the fifth century AD when the empire fell. During the third century, Londinium, the name given to the town by the Romans, had a population of 50,000 was mainly due to the influence of its major port. Greater London covers approximately 600 square miles and most of it built over the last hundred years. It's bisected by the Thames which has profoundly influenced its evolution. In the fifth century the Romans abandoned Londinium and left Britain. Invading Saxons created a new port to the west and a link to the church at Westminster. Isolated farmsteads were built in the countryside beyond. Many of these areas still use the Saxon place names, recognisable by the endings such as Ham, Ton, Witch and Worth. And from the 9th century, London grew again within the Roman walls. Medieval villages were built on Saxon sites and they were connected by a network of winding roads. Now, 40 years after it fell to the Visigoth army, around 450 AD, Vortigern, a local ruler, invited Danish mercenaries to defend his area of England from the attacks that were being led by the Picts and the Scots. However, the Danes turned on their host and established the first Saxon kingdom of England. Other mercenary groups invaded, resulting in this establishment of a patchwork of rival Saxon and Angle kingdoms that were continuously at war with one another. And these rivalries became known as the Dark Ages, a period when Anglo-Saxon art and literature, inspired by Christianity, became more refined. This period was violently ended by the constant invasion of Viking armies who established settlements and took over Saxon kingdoms. Eventually, after many battles, the separate kingdoms were unified during the reign of Ethelstan, and a unified England was created for the very first time. 
In 1066, on the death of Edward the Confessor, three men vied for the crown. Harold I, the man who took the throne, Harald Hardrada, the King of Norway, and William of Normandy. This rivalry led to two invasions. Harold I defeated the Vikings and crowned himself king on Christmas Day in 1066. And to control the defeated Saxons or Vikings, William gave vast tracts of land to his own lords and started to construct these vast stone castles. To raise money, he instructed that a detailed inventory be taken of all English lands, an undertaking which became known as the Domesday Book. Then William was succeeded by King John, who, believing he was above the law, forcefully took what he needed from the people. However, the barons disputed his demands, and in 1215, they presented the king with an ultimatum, a document that would later become known as the Magna Carta. And the year after its signing, King John died, and in 1216, his son, the nine-year-old Henry, inherited the throne. And as a consequence of repeated Anglo-Saxon invasions during the fifth century, Londinium declined and during the 8th century it became the capital, the capital became the Kingdom of Essex. During the 9th century, the town suffered numerous Viking attacks. You have been summoned here for a purpose. To avenge the death of our people. The English cannot murder Vikings and expect us to do nothing. So London Bridge is key for the invasion of England because if you take London, you take England. But it's this very well-defended structure. We need to know the enemy's strength around the bridge. There was a lot of elements to life's plan to bring down London Bridge. There's a lot of risk. If you are not in the right position when the tide turns, nothing will work. And as a consequence, Danish settlers established themselves in the area encouraging trade and opening businesses in the town, transforming it into the first urban centre of England. The town's wealth and power attracted the interest of the great Danish heathen army, which besieged the city until it was captured by King Alfred the Great in 1886. In 1067, following the Norman invasions and the conquering of England, the city's existing rights, laws and privileges were established by the newly crowned King of England, William, Duke of Normandy. There's probably no single thing that will give you an insight into life in the Middle Ages than the noble game of chess. It's been called the royal game, and there's a reason for that. In London, History divides into three main periods. There's the Roman period, which is called maybe the ancient period. There's the Renaissance that came about with the revolution in art, culture, and politics, and um, ways of thinking. And there's the Middle Ages, which as the name suggests, um, medieval, which means middle, falls in the middle. Perhaps nothing explains life, power and politics in the medieval or middle ages in London like the game of chess. And artists of all eras have been interested in chess. Called the royal game of rulers, soldiers, prisoners and exiles. The middle ages is the middle period of the three traditional divisions of Western history. Classical antiquity or the Roman period the medieval period and the modern period. With its roots in Latin, medi, meaning middle, and eve, meaning age, medieval literally means of the Middle Ages. And in this case, middle means between the Roman Empire and the Renaissance. From the early 20th century to the present, this interest has paralleled major social revolutions, with artists increasingly using chess imagery and ideas in their art. During such times, chess has provided 
a universally acknowledged societal model in miniature that artists redesign based on patterns of love, war and play. Sigmund Freud views chess as a parallel to psychoanalysis, a mapping of the mind, while French-born Marcel Duchamp saw chess as art. In 1944, art theorist André Breton insisted that what must be changed is the game itself, not the pieces. In this exhibition, prominent contemporary artists through serious or nonsensical creative play pushed the boundaries of interactivity, explored mental states, real or imagined, and transmuted chess courtship rituals into heated intimacies, and reconstructed new identities based on the game via the deconstruction of chosen environments. These leading contemporary artists offer new viewpoints from which to reconsider the creative and social landscape through chess, while the timeless conceptual landscape of the royal game stands ever ready to lend itself to future visions. Artists of all eras and cultures have been fascinated in chess. And the actual movement of the pieces on the board actually give quite a lot of information about how medieval London was. First of all, you had the military. They were the soldiers, or the pawns. Limited foot soldiers, usually, only able to move one space forward at a time. They were expendable, as they were in medieval times. Of more importance and more significance were the other pieces, like the knight, like knights were in medieval times. They had horses, armors, and various weaponry. And they could make dynamic moves on the board. The bishops represented the power of the religion, the power that they wielded through the connection, or supposed connection, with God. And God was big back then. Then you had the king. While seemingly the most important and powerful on the board, he's somebody that can't really do anything. He can only move one space at a time. He's a sitting duck. Everybody knows where he is. He's a visible target. And then you have the queen, the most powerful and effective piece on the whole board. She can move anywhere. And it's essentially like how a queen would work. She could also operate through whispers. She could plot things in secret command conspiracies and secret alliances. And that's pretty much how medieval England worked. It's a very fascinating game and uh, a powerful thing that artists have picked up on for centuries. As postcard worthy as they come, Tower Bridge is one of the most beloved and most iconic landmarks in all of London. The bridge which crosses the River Thames was built between 1886 and 1894 and stands tall as a true feat of Victorian engineering. Considered to be one of the most photographed bridges in the world, it's undoubtedly one of the, the essential things to see in London. And rather than just walking across it, a popular new activity is the upper levels glass walkway, where tourists can find some of the best river views in the area. In 1199, King John reinforced the city's self-government. And in 1215, the city could elect a different mayor every year. For many years, England had no capital city. However, the institutions of central government were moved to Westminster, close to London. This and the rise of trade in the area were the two decisive factors in London's emergence as the capital of England. During the 14th century, London's port became a European hub for the distribution of goods. This activity was strengthened during the 15th century thanks to its relevant textile industry. From the 16th to the mid-17th century, London benefited from the centralised politics and the maritime trade expansion 
developed by the Tudors and continued by the Stuarts. During Henry VIII's reign, London had 100,000 inhabitants. In mid-17th century, it had over 500,000. During the next hundred years, England was scourged by the plague. The Black Death, as it was known, was responsible for killing one third of the entire population. In 1665, the city was still held inside the ancient walls, although large scale urban planning had already started and the population's poor living conditions were responsible for this great plague. It killed 70,000 people which back then was a big percentage of the entire population of England. And the following year, a huge fire burnt down most of the city. Then there is the story of the infamous King Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII is probably best known for having six wives, and most British school children learn the following rhyme to help them remember the fate of each one. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Divorced, beheaded and died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. I'm Henry VIII, I had six sorry wives. Some might say I ruined their lives. In 1485, when Henry Tudor defeated Richard III, the Battle of Bosworth Field, the Tudor dynasty began. Henry VII, he ruled wisely, but after his son Arthur was killed, he decreed that his younger son, also called Henry, should marry Arthur's widow, Catherine. The wedding followed, and his son, the 18-year-old Henry VIII, happened as it was the subsequent coronation. And after 20 years of marriage and one daughter, Mary, Henry divorced Catherine as soon as she had not produced a son. So to ensure that the divorce, he broke with the Catholic Church and declared himself to be the head of the Church of England. In 1853, he married Anne Boleyn, and this marriage resulted in yet another daughter, Elizabeth. Three years later, he had Anne tried for treason, and she was executed in the Tower of London in 1536. Now, Henry VIII, as I said, married six times. And during his third marriage to Jane Seymour, he fathered a son named Edward. Jane died shortly after her son was born. And in 1547, Henry himself died, and Edward, who was then nine years old, inherited the crown. And he also died at just 15, and the crown passed to his cousin, Jane Grey who was forcibly deposed after nine days by Mary, Edward's elder half-sister, who wanted England to revert to Catholicism. He died childless in 1558, leaving Elizabeth to become the queen. Now, under Elizabeth I, the navy, which was established by Henry VIII, developed into England's primary power, primary source of defense, and became the means by which the English explored colonized and traded around the globe. This was a prosperous period. It was called England's Golden Age. Elizabeth never married. Dying, she, she indicated she wanted James VI of Scotland to succeed her. So, in 1603, James VI of Scotland became James I of England. His personal debts and Catholic baptism were the sources of some dissension and gave rise to the infamous assassination plot called the Gunpowder Plot. His successor and son, Charles, in 1625, took the throne and he believed that God had created him king. And due to that belief, he believed he was a king god. And he did not trust the English parliament. And between 1628 and 1640, he dismissed it, choosing to royal by royal decree a situation that led to the English Civil War. Now, Charles I was, was tried and found guilty of treason on January the 26th, 1649, and beheaded. 
The war ended when Cromwell's Parliament, New Model Army, defeated King Charles II's Royalist Army at the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651. Charles was exiled and replaced by the Commonwealth of England and then the Protectorate under the personal rule of Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell died in 1658 and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but he lacked his father's talents. And in May 1659, he resigned and Parliament arranged for Charles II to take the throne. In 1685, when the Catholic James II took the throne, several English politicians objected and wrote to William of Orange, a popular Protestant, who had married James II's daughter. He accepted the offer and landed at Brixham on November the 5th, 1688, and began a march on London. But before he arrived, however, James II fled to France, and William was crowned on April 21st, 1689, alongside his queen, Mary II. The couple ruled jointly until Mary's untimely death in 1694. William lived on for 10 years, dying in 1702 when Mary's sister ascended to the throne. When Anne died in 1714, the Georgian period began, named after the four Hanoverian Georges, and includes the short reign of William IV. It's a term used to describe the social, political, history, architecture, and fashions between 1714 and the 1830s, a period at the start of the Industrial Revolution that began around 1769 and lasted into the 1840s. And the Industrial Revolution helped make England one of the richest countries in the entire world. But it was around that time, however, that England lost control of the American colonies. All you need to keep your slaves under their beds is just to flounce about and shout off with their heads. The reconstruction of London, based on the area we now call the city, took over 10 years to complete. The architect Christopher Wren's masterpieces, such as St Paul's Cathedral, increased the appeal of London, and thus the capital became the centre of English social life, with its palaces, halls, theatres, societies and museums. London continued to grow thanks to the foundation of the Bank of England in 1694. It was the second central bank in the world, rapidly following the Swedish Sveriges Riksbank, and arguably the most successful. It provided the financial flexibility which would be the foundation of the empire's power and whose vestiges can be seen today in London's preeminence as a financial centre. We had the very regal marble arch. Walk through it and we're into Trafalgar Square. Most of current London is from the Victorian period. Up until the early years of the 19th century, the capital was confined to the boundaries of the original Roman city, as well as Westminster and Mayfair, and was surrounded by fields. 
Be that as it may, the Industrial Revolution drew millions of people to London, expanding the city. However, the overcrowded conditions led to grave problems, like the 1832 cholera epidemics, or the Great Stink of 1858, an event that took place during the hottest months of the summer, exacerbating the smell of the sewers that were dumped straight into the River Thames, which led to the suspension of the parliamentary session. This channel often investigates the dreadful living conditions of the poor in history and, with population growth and industrialization in Britain's towns and cities, that focus naturally falls on slums. The journalists and philanthropists, who provided us first-hand accounts of these notorious neighborhoods, didn't varnish the truth of what they witnessed for the sensibilities of their audience, but perhaps didn't always go into as much detail about the extreme and harrowing squalor they saw, as much as the report you will hear today. Slums, or rookeries, are evocative of hellish urban poverty in the 19th century for us today, for good reason. Poorly constructed, overcrowded housing was characterized by gloomy, narrow streets and alleyways. They took on the no doubt unwelcome to the poor whose home it was, sobriquet of rookery. This mocking the rook, being a bird that habitually nests in large colonies crammed into noisy treetops. They are often caricatured and mysterious and dark places where journalists and cartographers feared to tread. But there were social commentators who sought to walk amongst the poor and highlight their lives and living conditions by publishing what they saw and heard. From 1750, the population increased from 700,000 to over 4.5 million in 1901. 6,600,000 if we included the suburban areas. At the end of the 19th century, London had become a major international trade and finance capital. When Queen Victoria came to the throne, in 1837, aged just 18, she was the ruler of Great Britain, Canada, Australia, England, New Zealand, and a lot of parts of Africa. Her rule heralded an unprecedented series of inventions and discoveries. And when she died in 1902, her reign seemed to have been the invention of steam power, industrialization, and major advancements in the arts. The 20th century began with the death of Victoria succeeded by her son, Edward. Edwardian England was a period of decadence and enjoyment. However, Edward's reign only lasted nine years. He died in 1910 and was succeeded by his son, George V. Now the causation of the First World War from 1914 to 1918 was long and protracted as each European country found themselves dragged into the conflict after Germany declared war on Russia on the 1st of August, 1914, and then France three days after. And on the 4th of August, Britain too declared war. When World War I ended in 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, it had become the deadliest conflict in the history of the world. As an outcome of the war, some women who had worked at jobs usually filled by men, were granted the vote in 1918, whilst all women gained the same voting rights as men in 1928. Post-World War I, England underwent a period of unrest when different industrial workers went on strike for better working conditions and higher wages, leading up to the Great General Strike of 1926, which was then soon followed by the Great Depression. In January 1936, King George V died and was succeeded by his eldest son, Edward VIII. However, Edward had fallen in love with a divorced American lady, Wallace Simpson. And even in the 1930s, a member of the royal family was not allowed to marry a divorcee. And Edward refused to break up his relationship. And on December the 11th, 1936, he abdicated the throne, passing the crown onto his brother. When war broke out again in 1939, when England stood firm against the aggression of Nazi Germany, it ended 
in 1945, and the reconstruction of London and England began. In 1951, the Festival of Britain was staged to celebrate the national recovery. In the 1960s, there was a huge social and sexual revolution with the invention of the pill, when groups such as the Beatles led youth culture and Swinging London happened, directing the whole world's eyes to these new fashion trends. It also saw new technological advances, such as the moon landing, supersonic flight, the joining of the EEC, and the establishment of London as a global financial centre. However, as the 20th century came to an end and the 21st century began, England's power and status in the world seems to have waned. Where its future and global position will be in the latter part of the 21st century post-Brexit and all the other strife that is happening in, in the kingdom at, at the moment, post-Queen Elizabeth's passing and Charles's coronation, only time will tell.